before we get into the program itself and before I introduce our speaker, I first want to take a moment to acknowledge that today, wherever you're gathered, whether it be on at uh, in Seattle or in a different state, you're on Indigenous land. And if, like me, you're in Seattle, you're on the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and all Coast Salish people. We want to acknowledge the forced displacement of Native communities from this land while honoring the endurance of the Duwamish people who still live here. And to this day, the Duwamish people have still yet to receive federal recognition. And we encourage you to learn more by visiting the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center when it, in West Seattle when it's safe to do so, as well as visiting their website to learn more about them and about their fight for federal recognition. We also want to acknowledge that there was a major shooting that happened last night in Georgia and that it's connected to larger waves of anti-Asian violence that have been happening both nationally and regionally. It's been a year where a global pandemic has laid bare existing disparities and fueled a rise in anti-Asian violence. And Mohai condemns acts that promote iniquity or acts that disenfranchise or marginalize people. We stand firmly on the side of inclusion, equity, and cultural empathy. As a history museum, we have the rich resource of the past to guide us forward. And by examining our history together, we can learn from where we've been and imagine a better future. So please join us in supporting the work of learning from history, not just at Mohai, but also at the important cultural institutions of our city, including the Wing Luke Museum, Densho, Nisi Veterans Committee, Japanese Cultural Center, and many, many more. So thank you so much for being here. And I'm now going to ask our speaker for tonight to join us, Josephine Ensign. Josephine Ensign is the professor of nursing at the University of Washington in Seattle, where she teaches public health and health policy. She's the author of several award-winning books, as well as um, uh, Skid Road on the Frontier of Health and Homelessness in an American City, which is forthcoming from Johns Hopkins University Press. And if you are excited about this book, as I am, you can pre-order it through the Mohai Mercantile, and we'll put that link in the chat. Um, yes, so I'm going to let you take it away now. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, as I said, we really, learning from the past illuminates the present and the future. And so we're going to do that with the very important topic of homelessness tonight. Thank you, Rachel. And also thank you, um, Jennifer, um, both Mohai and History Link for this opportunity. And thank, thank um, all of you that are on here tonight. So I am also a white woman, um, also Celtic. <laughs> um, uh, I am um, a blonde, blue-eyed blue um, person, and I am a nurse, teacher, researcher, mother, grandmother, and <clears throat> I'm a southerner, but transplanted here to my adopt, what I call my adopted city of Seattle, um, city I love, 27 years ago. And the other part of my identity that um, is important for the, the talk tonight is that um, I did have the lived experience of homelessness as a young adult. Sorry about that, um, health and homelessness. And this, um, the, the interaction of health and homelessness I hope will become the importance of it um, will become, if you're not already aware of that, uh, more aware of that during the talk. I do think that in our current um, kind of policy, public policy debates um, across the country, but especially here in Seattle and King County with our considerable um, homeless um, of issues and population is that health is oftentimes overlooked and neglected. And if it's mentioned at all, it's usually what we um, uh, now term behavioral health, which is a problematic term that includes mental health and um, substance use disorder. Because if we look at, for all of us, um, and obviously the pandemic has highlighted this for us as individuals, um, for us in our communities, in our country, in our world, 
But if we look at what really helps um, promote health and well being for us at a community and at an individual level, these are the same factors that prevent um, and shorten homelessness. So these are the, so what we call the social determinants of health, um, community social cohesion, early childhood family supports, access to appropriate quality primary health care, and adequate and safe affordable housing. And one thing I think is um, also important to acknowledge that um, currently um, across the country, um, someone who is homeless uh, has um, on average a 12 year um, deficit in life expectancy versus their, their housed um, contemporaries. So additional acknowledgements, and I do wanna just emphasize that my Skid Road project of which um, my, my forthcoming book is, is a component, um, it's been um, going on since 2013, and it will go on um, uh, um, into the indefinite future. And it's very collaborative. I just want to call out um, Lorraine McConaughey, who's an amazing public historian, has been my mentor for this. And also Lisa Oberg, who's the Associate Director of History of Science and Medicine Curator at the University of Washington Special Collections. And then all of these others um, with funding and um, support um, for my ongoing project. And as part of it, as part of my um, Skid Road project, I've completed 36 oral history interviews with people living at the intersection of health and homelessness in, um, in Seattle and King County. And that has been put on pause because of the pandemic, but I hope to continue that um, post pandemic. And the other um, part of it that I just want to call out as well, I'll be sharing some five minute videos that I have made around the Skid Road project. And I'll also be working with Jill Friedberg, who's a local um, Seattle area filmmaker, amazing, amazing filmmaker, to have a, a somewhat longer 10 to 15 minute um, video, including oral history interview um, footage uh, this summer. So this um, definitely, since this is through Mohai, if, you, um, if you're in the position um, and, and you desire to pre-order uh, my book, uh, go through and support Mohai. If you go through Johns Hopkins University Press, um, I include a discount code there of 30%. So, but to also acknowledge, and this is part of my, my bookcase um, of books that I have relied on for informing um, my ongoing kind of research and, 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 and writing for my Skid Road book. And the first one up obviously is Murray Morgan, um, Skid Road and an informal portrait of Seattle. And those of you, it sounds like some of you are moving to Seattle. This is a really important book um, that gives you a lot of the history, the important history of Seattle um, in a very uh, engaging, engaging format. And then the other one I want to call out, um, along with the land acknowledgement that Rachel that Rachel um, has done, is Call Thrush's Native Seattle, which is a real again a very uh, highly readable book and um, important information about the founding and the ongoing kind of relationship of um, the city of Seattle with um, our Native um, Indigenous populations. So. Um, I love foot care. I just have this photograph to also mention that I, I am a nurse, a family nurse practitioner. I've been working in direct service and direct um, primary care for homeless uh, populations um, uh, since, the, since the early and mid, mid 1980s, um, which is on the right with bangs, an unfortunate bang incident. And I continue to do that. It's obviously been um, affected by the pandemic, but with our students from the University of Washington, our medical nursing um, and dental students at area uh, homeless shelters. And this also, again, informs my, my Skid Road project. So I mentioned that um, part of my overall Skid Road project, and by the way, there'll be a link to my um, website page on the overall Skid Road project, and these are available um, on that. Um, 
and I'll be adding to them as, as I make them. I'm not gonna be showing you the one tonight, um, honor their stories. That was the, the very first one that I made this summer. That is the story of uh, Princess Angeline Kikosomo, um, who was Chief Seattle's daughter and who lived, this is a photograph of her um, in her one room kind of shanty house in the Belltown area of Seattle. But I will be showing you the two others. Early Seattle boosters portrayed the city as being built on seven hills. They claimed that Seattle was the healthiest city in the nation. In reality, Seattle was built on water, on tide flats filled with sawdust from lumber mills, on land wrangled from the abundant rivers, lakes, and swamps. Since its founding as a settler colonial frontier town, Seattle has had regular outbreaks of infectious diseases, and its people have suffered injuries from industries like logging, fishing, and mining. From the beginning, Seattle has had one of our nation's highest rates of homelessness, a boom and bust economy, the extremes of great wealth and abject poverty. It's not just a religious, but also a civic duty to care for those less fortunate. The emerging United States adopted versions of the English poor laws, along with the conflicted views on poverty. Poverty as a result of individual sin, poverty as an unfortunate yet necessary societal evil, especially for societies built on capitalism. In the early years of the founding of Seattle, scientific charity became fashionable the belief that charity work should be made more efficient, empirical, and secular. Public health research established that poor health, poor living and working conditions, both causes and prolongs poverty. Workhouses and poor farms were established. Overseeing the poor became the job of government. In 1854, the Washington Territorial Legislature passed the first poor laws. The duty to support a poor person was first the responsibility of the person's family. In their absence, county officials were responsible for the provision of board, nursing, and medical care to any non-resident pauper falling ill while in the county and for the provision of a proper burial in case of death. King County, where Seattle is located, established a pauper's gravesite on land along the Duwamish River a few miles south of downtown Seattle. The county commissioners auctioned off care of paupers to the lowest bidder. When the number of wards of the county increased, the commissioners opened a poor farm beside the pauper's graveyard. They contracted with the Sisters of Providence to take over the nursing and boarding of the county's poor. Three sisters arrived in Seattle on May 1, 1877 and opened the King County Poor Farm and Hospital. Their first patient was a 43-year-old laborer Originally from Norway, he was admitted on May 19th and died on July 12th. The first female patient, a 19-year-old domestic servant, along with her two-month-old infant, were admitted on May 26th and discharged a few weeks later. The sisters record that they encountered anti-Catholic bias from the community, along with a stigma attached to what was considered a poorhouse and not a hospital. After 14 months of caring for patients at the poor farm, the sisters and their patients relocated to Providence Hospital, the sisters' newly built hospital in downtown Seattle. King County commissioners continued to contract with the Sisters of Providence until 1887, when they hired their own nurses and moved the county patients back to a refurbished King County Hospital at the poor farm, expanding further in 1906 to a 225-bed hospital and finally, in 1931, to the new 400-bed Harborview Hospital on First Hill in Seattle. Harborview Medical Center continues to fulfill King County's mission of providing health care to people experiencing financial barriers to care. It is the largest hospital provider of charity care in Washington State and is the only level one trauma and burn center for Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. It is a center of our area's disaster preparedness and response, disasters including earthquakes and pandemics. 
During the COVID-19 pandemic, when we were asked to shelter in place and overcrowded homeless shelters were shuttered, the former Harborview Nurses Home, now called Harborview Hall, across the street from the main hospital, was converted into a 45-bed isolation and recovery center for people with no permanent housing. We may still have conflicted views on poverty and homelessness, but we also recognize that we are our brothers, our sisters, keepers. So um, one thing I wanna say about that video, which um, I, I, I just um, finished um, producing um, a couple weeks ago, um, and in, in additional research um, for, that I you know, had already done, obviously, um, and uh, especially for my book, but I found out, or it just kind of sunk into me, that King County had a pauper's gravesite um, uh, along the Duwamish River um, and, and in an area that had been um, like the site of, of um, a Duwamish um, uh, settlement area, that they had the, the pauper's gravesite before they had any kind of, of hospital. So, that, that to me is, is fairly poignant. So um, this photograph, um, I was working in 2015 teaching um, uh, health humanities to Harborview nurses. And it was um, uh, around the time when Yesler Terrace, which is in the foreground here, Harborview Hospital is in the background. It was when Yasser Terrace, which is um, was one of our country's first uh, racially integrated public housing um, units in, in the country um, uh, when it was being demolished and in its place um, is going up, uh, you know, the euphemistic mixed, uh, mixed income housing. Um, I'll have additional uh, videos talking about the history of Yesler Terrace. And this one, a similar time, just in terms of, of land use and ongoing debates, obviously, in terms of homeless encampments, um, uh, abatements of, uh, or, uh, kind of stopping of the, the sweeps um, during, during the uh, COVID pandemic, um, but ongoing uh, debates here locally about, about homelessness, um, visible homelessness. So this photograph I love, um, and Lisa Oberg, if um, she's on, can, can probably tell you even more about it. I love this photograph. It is um, at the intersection, about at the intersection of what is now First and Jackson Street. It's what had been originally called Front Street because it went along the waterfront. And this is from 1866. So this is in the Pioneer, what's now called the Pioneer um, District of, um, Pioneer Square District of, of Seattle. And on the far left is Seattle Hospital. So it's arguably Seattle's first hospital on the far right hand side, um, it's in that frame is the house um, for Doc Maynard, Seattle's first, uh, first physician and his wife, second wife, Catherine, who again, arguably could be um, considered Seattle's first nurse. And right next to Doc Maynard's house is um, Mrs. Conklin's hotel, um, also called the Felker House and uh, Madame Damnable is also her moniker. And it was a, a rooming house, one of the first rooming houses um, and, and also uh, a Seattle's first brothel. And in the um, background, if you can see the kind of spired, um, uh, uh, building on the hill, and that's the Territorial University um, that became the University of Washington. So I love this kind of triangulation of, um, of different aspects of the uh, early life of Seattle. And the next one that I want to show you is the story of Seattle's first official homeless um, person. And I do wanna point out some people have asked in, in the past, well, how could I say that this is Seattle's first homeless person when you know the whole displacement of, um, of Coast Salish people? 
Um, but this again goes with the poor laws that were adopted in Washington Territory and King County um, and who was considered a citizen and um, a resident of Washington Territory in Seattle and who could be actually considered um, a pauper. Seattle historian Murray Morgan once wrote, at the foot of the hills between the office buildings and the bay lies a narrow strip of land. Here on the waterfront, Seattle's history and Seattle's future meet and merge. A man was found here in late December, 1854, along a stretch of waterfront called Babaquab, Little Prairie in Coast Salish, now called Belltown. The man was Edward Moore, a 32-year-old sailor from Worcester County, Massachusetts. Built on Duwamish land, Seattle was barely a town, having been founded in King County, Washington Territory, only two years before. It consisted of Yesler Sawmill, a Methodist Episcopal Church, Madame Damnable's brothel, and a handful of homes, including that of Seattle's first physician, Doc Maynard. Seattle's first teacher and minister's wife, Catherine Blaine, in letters to her parents, described many single, impoverished, rootless white men who sometimes literally washed up on the town's shores. More than a few of these men she labeled as insane and linked their insanity with their disconnection from families and having lived through traumas like wars and shipwrecks. In a letter dated March 15, 1855, Catherine wrote of Edward Moore, our community, though small, gives an opportunity for the exercise of benevolent feelings. The county has had to take care of a poor, sick, crazy, half-frozen man for two to three months past. Edward Moore had been living in a makeshift tent on the Seattle beach, living off raw shellfish. Seattle's townspeople carried him to the town's one rooming house where Doc Maynard amputated his frozen toes with an ax. Moore survived this primitive surgery and was cared for by Doc Maynard and his wife, Catherine. Edward Moore was deemed by Doc Maynard to be crippled, insane, and a stranger besides. Stranger meaning Moore had no friends or relatives in the area. He was not a Seattle resident. The understanding and care of people with mental illness had been undergoing significant change with the work of reformers like the French physician Philippe Pinel and the New England reformer and nurse Dorothea Dix. Instead of viewing insanity as a consequence of sin, chaining people in jails, humane care in rural, idyllic settings came to be the standard of care. No such place existed in Washington Territory at the time when Edward Moore lived in Seattle. The newly enacted poor laws of the territory stipulated that counties were responsible for the care of people made poor due to ill health, including insanity. In essence, Edward Moore became Seattle's first homeless person. King County auctioned off the care of Edward Moore to the lowest bidder, a then common practice known as a trade in lunacy, a practice rife with abuse and one which Dorothea Dix denounced. In the summer of 1856, King County commissioners failed to auction off the care of Edward Moore. They had unsuccessfully petitioned the Washington Territorial Legislature for reimbursement of $1,659 for his care. Townsfolk took up a collection, bought Moore a new suit of clothes, and paid a ship's captain to take him back to his home state of Massachusetts. At this point, Moore disappears from the official histories of Seattle. His story did not end here. He returned to Worcester County, where it seems he was taken in by his sister's family in Ashburnham, a mill town on the headwaters of the Merrimack River. He turns up in official county records on May 12, 1859. Edward Moore, age 36, son of Pittmore, married, no occupation, died in Ashburnham, cause of death, suicide by hanging, cause insanity. We know that poverty, homelessness, and trauma contribute to worsening mental health. Currently, Washington State has one of our nation's highest rates of mental illness and one of our worst mental health treatment systems. Western State Hospital, our first public mental health hospital, which opened 15 years after Edward Moore left Seattle, 
recently lost federal funding due to its poor quality of care. At the same time, in November of 2020, King County voters approved Proposition 1, Health for All, a bond measure that will expand behavioral services at Harborview Medical Center, a commitment to addressing our ongoing homelessness and mental health crises. So that one, a couple of things I want to point out um, from that. Um, for one thing, reading the letters, uh, the collected and published letters of Catherine Blaine, Seattle's first school teacher, are fairly painful. Um, uh, she was extremely educated um, and um, and very very um, kind of uh, zealous in terms of her missionary missionary spirit. Um, she was also very racist, especially in terms of, of um, indigenous um, people um, living in Seattle. Um, and the other thing about that that I want that I just want to point out because some people have questions about the term trade and lunacy that that is a real term in terms of, um, of taking care of, of people um, who are diagnosed with were diagnosed with mental illness, and the auctioning off to the lowest bidder for care of official paupers um, obviously was wider than just people who had mental illness, and that was the the basically the trade in paupers. So that's uh, not a misstatement. It is to um, for the most part was um, was to the lowest the lowest bidder and. Um, and that did happen in Seattle and in the case of, of Edward Moore. And there's um, a lot more to his story. I have some of the timeline here in this slide. He was, he was also cared for not only in Seattle, but also in um, Pierce County um, by Dr. Matthew Burns and the Washington Territorial Legislature um, in their kind of official ruling on not uh, reimbursing King County and, and, and Dr. Burns for the care of Edward Moore said that, um, you know, it, it would basically bankrupt the, the new territory. Um, and it, it actually was more than what they were taking in that year. So a couple of mentions uh, more about uh, Dorothy Dix. Um, and uh, she was um, pretty amazing in terms of her uh, health reform efforts. Um, and it wasn't only in, in the United States, but also in, um, in Europe um, and uh, throughout the, the um, uh, uh, England and also Scotland. And she, um, after the Civil War, came to Washington Territory and visited um, the, um, the mental health uh, that was happening down around Olympia and was advocating again against the trade in lunacy and of having a medical doctor in charge of supervising the care um, for that. And the other part of this is that she introduced and fought for the 10 million acre bill, um, which would have been federal support for mental health, uh, state of the art mental health treatment um, throughout the, the states and territories. Um, it was passed by Congress, but vetoed by President um, Pierce, who of course was also an alcoholic and one of our worst presidents. These I had mainly as placeholders, but this I do want to call out one other um, part that I talk about a lot in, in the, uh, one of the opening chapters of my book, which I find fascinating is um, the, the kind of the conception and the treatment of people with what we consider um, uh, having mental illness. Um, by, by people who are indigenous in terms of the Pacific Northwest. And there was a term um, in Chinook jargon um, uh, by the, the Coast Salish people for someone with mental illness and it was Pelton, which um, if you look at the derivation of that was from Archibald Pelton who followed the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, he witnessed um, um, some pretty violent deaths of his entire um, party that he was with and he, um, and he went in, insane. And so it is interesting just that the indigenous term 
um, for mental illness was for you know, basically white people who had these, these certain kinds of, um, of characteristics. And the treatment was, uh, is much different, was much different. And there are, are indications that um, uh, the uh, Coast Salish um, people who had um, uh, kind of like a shellfish processing area in the, what's now the Belltown area, that they were uh, kind of looking out for Edward Moore. These I again have in case the video didn't um, didn't play. Um, there's much more to Edward Moore's story. I have not been able to track down. I, I know the name of his wife. Um, he was married um, before he became a sailor and came to Seattle. Um, but there's no indication that he uh, went back to live with her. Um, he went, uh, was living with um, his sister and with his then elderly parents when he, when he um, uh, killed himself. So a couple of other things which are kind of interesting, um, especially off of the poor laws, is that the antique law, um, in terms of family uh, being kind of the first, the first tier of um, of being responsible for the care. Of, um, of poor people, um, that it's still on the books in, in a lot of these uh, states, not, not in Washington, but it is um, still on the books in Oregon. And there um, people have talked about that it could um, be uh, brought back in terms of especially um, uh, children taking care of their elderly, elderly um, parents who are poor. And this just to uh, highlight um, the level of homelessness in Seattle, especially for those of you who aren't from the Seattle area. Um, we probably have uh, definitely in the top three um, in terms of um, rates of homelessness among, among uh, urban areas, um, New York City and LA uh, kind of beat us out in some, some cases but a very high level of chronic homelessness and also vehicle homelessness, which um, has increased during the pandemic. And this is the kind of mandatory federally man mandated uh, point in time count that happens, uh, usually happens every, at the end of every January, but it had to be um, uh, not done this, this uh, year because of the pandemic. The other thing, and um, the Seattle Times did a really good series on this in terms of the the fact that Washington State, in terms in trying to trying to address the high rate of um, of mental illness and our kind of poor access to, especially inpatient mental health treatment, of um, for Medicaid patients having um, for-profit hospitals start taking care of them, and the fact that there. Are, um, not very well supervised. And um, if you want to read more about that, the Seattle Times has really good series on the problems with that, which again, kind of echoing back to the trade in lunacy. And these are some publications, including like a history link um, essay that I have that will be linked for you um, again on the webpage that I have and also where the, the three videos are if you want to take a look at those and share them. So that's what I have. Are there questions? Oh, thank you for your support. Um, and Mohai would, would, would definitely thank you for additional support. Um, they're amazing resource um, uh, uh, here in, in Puget Sound, but also nationally. And then also a heads up to next month's um, History Cafe, the Filipino American labor activism in fields and canneries. Thank you. Yes, so if you haven't had a chance to ask your question yet, um, please put it in the Q&A box that is down at the bottom of the screen um, and I will go through and ask them as they come in. So I'll give you a chance to uh, write those in, um, but we, we love hearing from you. Um, or you can, or you can also put them, it looks like in the chat we've got, uh, that the, the sheltered count took place, but the unsheltered count mm -hmm. didn't. Ah, thank you. Oh. Right, um, that shelters are at kind of reduced capacity as well. 
Um, thanks for that cl clarification. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so we do have our first question, uh, which is a little bit more on what kind of research led you to Edward Moore? Uh, this person says it's an amazing story. How did you yeah. how did you go down that research rabbit hole to find him? Right. And yeah, the rabbit hole is definitely it. So yeah, I mean, especially for me, um, the lived experience of homelessness and you know, working working decades with people experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, there there's similar factors in terms of homelessness, but everybody's story is is I mean, it's an individual story. And, um, and we're not always privy um, as healthcare providers um, uh, to know what the ending of the story is, um, so to speak. And it was really frustrating to me as, um, as I started learning about him. It was just kind of, uh, you know, I moved here from Baltimore because um, I graduated from, from Hopkins and moved here. And, and homelessness, even back 30 years ago, was so visible. Um, here in Seattle, but also like the hopefulness, a younger city, uh, much more progressive in terms of what, what we want to do. So um, there was, a, um, uh, I came across Skid Road, Murray Morgan Skid Road when I first moved here, and he talks uh, a, a bit about um, Murray Morgan. Um, and so I was intrigued with his story, but he didn't know, you know there's nothing about like what happened to him after he was shipped off to back to Boston. And so again, starting back in 2013, I just started digging, um, talking with people, digging. And it wasn't until um, I, was, I was actually on, on a Fulbright in, in Edinburgh. And, um, and, a, and I just happened to, because he none of the kind of published things where he has a middle name and he has a fairly, and by the way, he's, he, he is um, Irish American, was Irish American no middle initials, it's common name. So it was hard to track on some things, but um, it was uh, just kind of a random um, email that I sent to a librarian for the Worcester um, Public um, Library. And she found his, his death record and sent it to me. Um, and then, so then I was able to start when I had his birth date and his death date and the name of his father, I was able to start kind of triangulating and going down that rabbit hole more. Thank you. It's really, I think it's part of what we love getting into at History Cafe too, is um, both the content, but also the process of how do we unearth these stories that haven't been told um, and are hidden. And like you said, like it means a lot more to get to know that ending instead of it being this person disappeared into this black hole. Right. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I really wrestled with, um, with that, and also like with um, Kikasomas and Princess Angeline or any, any of the, the, the people's stories um, um, from the research for my book is also the ethics of it, right? Because even though that person, um, uh, Edward Moore is dead, he has relatives, he was a person. Um, and so how to, uh, tell his story in, um, in, in a way that felt good to me, that wasn't purient, you know, I mean, there are details that yeah. I purposely left out. So. Yeah. Well, oh, I think that's, that's often hard, especially stories about people who did not have wealth and who do not have control over, um, how they're remembered and that right. often are, um, I think in past publications used as um, moralistic stories of what not to be. So. Right, and and um, in the case of Edward Moore, there's no, absolutely no indication that he um, that he was an alcoholic or drank at all. Um, so we have a question from a viewer asking, is there anywhere, city or country, <laughs> is there anywhere in the world uh, uh, that is managing mental health, poverty, homelessness more effectively um, than in Seattle, I assume? Um, yes. I mean, I would say, I mean, no, no country, no city is perfect, right? Um, so, but I would say, because I, I lived in, in, in Scotland and in, in Edinburgh um, and for about six months and, um, and they have um, mental health cafes, um, similar to in Seattle, we have the recovery cafe, but 
these are mental health cafes and also um, cafes um, that um, are very welcoming to people with all different kinds of, of, of abilities. And um, um, so not just for, it's not just like for people with mental illness kind of a thing. It's also helping um, kind of merge the general population um, uh, with, with people that, again, are just differently abled in whatever way it is. And, and, they, and they, I mean, it helps that they have a national health service. <laughs> um, it's not perfect, um, uh, obviously, um, but they, they do have an emphasis on um, kind of integration of, of mental health and um, kind of primary care. And most of their, they don't really have community or public health nurses. They are, they're mental health um, nurses um, who are out in the communities working with people, working, working with, um, with children and also trying to do upstream measures um, uh, in terms of identifying victims of different kinds of traumas and intervening, intervening early so that that doesn't contribute to homelessness later. Yeah. That makes sense, kind of the idea of preventative care that we often don't want to fund, <laughs> but can be so helpful. Um, this is yeah, related to what can we do to improve the quality of care uh, is both what can we do to improve the quality of care and housing that we provide in Seattle. Uh, this viewer read a story in the Seattle Times about substandard housing last week. Um, and thought about how this is tied to this idea of auctioning care to the lowest bidder. Right, yeah, again, Seattle Times, their project homelessness has done a, a really excellent job of, of following um, some of these um, kinds of issues. And that I believe was about um, what was supposed to be sober um, housing um, and was not, ended up not being that way um, for people. And that, um, and that it is interesting because obviously there's no kind of one size fits all, especially around substance use disorder, what works you know, for different people. But Seattle has been a leader um, in our country and even in the world in terms of housing first, like our 1811 building, the you know, kind of wet house um, for chronic inebriates, um, which has been shown to be you know, quality care and also cost effective um, for taxpayers, for, for in the individuals um, affected by, by really severe alcoholism and, and homelessness. So I think again, of having and having um, the, the ongoing problem in terms of not having a regional coordinated response, um, Seattle, is, is obviously the biggest city um, in King County, but it's, um, it's a regional issue. Um, and, um, and where the other parts of King County are not necessarily um, working together with Seattle or Seattle being perceived as the bully um, in some of it, I think has, has been uh, part of the ongoing challenge um, for, our region. And then the other thing, I mean, I, I talk about this in my, in my book, I was on committees, seemed to be never ending committees, the 10 year plans in homelessness, um, which I think went on, <laughs> I don't know how many decades, but um, uh, health healthcare was an afterthought um, with those discussions. And we have a really robust um, um, through the uh, national um, healthcare for the homeless, we have a, a healthcare for the homeless program that kind of dis disperses out to different programs throughout um, King County, and they weren't really at the table very well. So I think, um, uh, again, um, having, having much more of a regional response and of, of not doing the Pacific Northwest thing of st studying something to death and having meetings to death, but um, having evidence-based um, interventions. Um, to, that, that we know work for a lot of these different issues. Yeah, I was curious. I mean, just over having been here the past five years, I feel like I've seen a number of different iterations of um, <laughs> countywide coalitions and the name keeps changing and I keep thinking it's a new thing and then it's just the same thing with a new name. Um, I, I am curious if you see 
um, has this pandemic given any more urgency, any more fire under those uh, coalitions to um, come together past whatever has kind of been the splintering issues in the past, or has it actually led to more fractiousness between city and county? Yeah, and this, um, I, I can't say I'm an expert at that kind of like um, you know, 30,000 level um, view of it. My sense though, is that, um, I mean, everybody, every, um, every region and you know, throughout King County as well the, you know, the rest of the world has really been scrambling in, in an emergency um, sort of a mentality in terms of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, I know, because I was on some of these, but very early on, you know, it was now over a year ago, right, when it, when, um, when Seattle and King County um, kind of first went into uh, pandemic um, response mode, there were very good and very um, sensitive conversations going on about the fact that um, uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness, living homeless, li living homeless, um, they were at risk, um, obviously at higher risk um, of contracting um, COVID-19 and of dying because of all of the other kinds of underlying illnesses and, and, and issues that they have. And of also um, having the backlash in terms of uh, people blaming, um, you know, somebody who's visibly homeless as if they're the vectors of this disease, um, which, is, which is not true. Um, so I know that there were early on and ongoing um, kind of equity issues. There still is in terms of the vaccine rollout of how do we get, you know, who, who's prioritized, right? Um, with, uh, with the vaccines and the fact that, um, that people who, you know, are living rough, living, living homeless are, um, no matter what their age, are at increased risk of really bad com complications from a COVID um, infection and that they should be <clears throat> high on, on the list for, for vaccinations. Have they, has that been added? I haven't seen as far It's, as I would say in that I'm, I'm, I'm on the policy committee for the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and they now have a public um, uh, kind of portal for reporting on um, not only COVID-19 testing, uh, but also co um, uh, the, the, the vaccinations um, specifically for populations that are homeless across the country. Um, uh, there, I think there have been some individual efforts, um, but from my perspective in this area, not, it, it's, it's fairly chaotic, I would say. <laughs> But, you know, people are dealing with um, uh, something unprecedented, right? Yeah. So somebody just asked, um, wondering if focusing on mental health and healthcare needs of people experiencing homelessness may distract from the primary issue of housing affordability. Um, so I'm not sure if that person wants to say more about um, what their question is, but I think it's maybe yeah no no, no. I, I scarcity think, of resources yeah, yeah, wondering yeah. where to put attention um, right 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 yeah, I'll, think, I'll let yeah. you take that where you will <laughs> yeah I, I get to ask this a lot um because there's you know a kind of an emphasis on on talking about houselessness versus homelessness and of saying it's it's housing stupid right um it's affordable housing and it is housing, but it's not just that. Um, and speaking as someone who experienced homelessness, speaking as someone who's worked in homelessness issues my entire adult life, um, it's also about that social cohesion and those connections um, that fall apart, which is also like why, partly why Seattle from the very beginning has had a high rate of homelessness, of being disconnected from families, from communities, um, support networks. So it's not just housing. And so um, I'm not saying that we should uh, take the emphasis off of affordable, um, supportive housing um, and put it all on, on healthcare and, and health issues, including mental health issues. Um, I'm just saying that, um, that, that health needs to be 
holistically health needs to be part of that equation um, because, because of that interaction. Um, people who have health issues, including physical health issues, um, like with the COVID-19 pandemic um, can spiral into, into homelessness. Um, and that uh, definitely um, can also prolong homelessness for, um, for people um, across the age spectrum. That makes sense. Um, related to mental health, uh, someone was wondering why um, the idea of behavioral health is not useful or appropriate. Yeah, behavioral, yeah. So behavioral health has an interesting uh, history itself. It's probably been around for about 40 years. It had been uh, much more early on used as like our health behaviors, you know, like eat healthy foods and, you know, exercise, whatever, you know, all, all the things that we know. Um, and um, probably for the past uh, 10 or 15 years, it's, it's um, become uh, more commonly used for kind of an umbrella term for both mental health issues and uh, substance use disorders as kind of a catch-all thing. And some people say it's because it's light and fluffy um, and not as, as uh, stigmatizing as, as mental illness, um, substance use um, disorder. Um, but it, it is um, problematic, uh, I think, because it, it's emphasizing individual behaviors when we know that individual, well, for one thing, uh, both mental illness and substance use disorder, it's not just a behavior. Um, it has lots of um, other um, uh, kinds of kinds of issues behind it, as as well as again the social determinants of that um, you know, exposure to to trauma in childhood that wasn't treated, things like that, and that's not a behavior. Right, that makes sense. I never thought of it that way. Thank you. Um, another question was: Did you mention that there's also going to be a documentary that you're going coming out, or was that the the mm. series of videos that are going to be? On your website. Yeah, so these um, um, the these are part of kind of like the overall public scholarship that will be ongoing, um, and that I'm doing a series of the of the um, of the short five minute videos like the ones that I showed tonight, but I'm also going to be working with um, the filmmaker Seattle filmmaker Jill Friedberg, and um, and Lorraine McConaughey, and we'll be making. Um, more of a kind of in, in the documentary vein that includes um, footage that I have from the, the oral history interviews that I've done, again, the 36 that I've done over, over the years that inform the work. And so that I'm hoping to um, have come out by the end of the summer. And it, all of these are publicly available, accessible. Um, we'll be working on um, um, like educational kinds of guides um, for people to use as teachers, whatever um, discussion guides, as well as um, Lorraine McConaughey is going to be doing a um, reader's theater um, script as well. Oh, that's exciting. So again, it's, it's like, um, it's a work in progress. It's going to continue going on and, and it's uh, very collaborative. So yeah, I love how many different formats uh, there are and like roads into this really important information. Um, so this question was spurred by the photo early on of you when you were just getting started nursing and uh, they found the, the photos, the two different photos of you washing people's feet very moving as a compassionate action. I wanted to know more about your work with uh, nursing students and, and specifically in regard to homelessness. Ah, thanks. Well, of course, you know, in, in many different world religions, uh, foot washing has, has, um, has a long, a long tradition again of, of humility and, um, and also, um, compassion, um, for people. It's not just a Judeo Christian, um, also in, um, Islamic, um, faith. And, um, and so, um, and if you have ever worked with someone who's homeless, you've been homeless yourself, you know someone who's homeless, um, uh, feet are essential. Um, obviously, um, not everybody has the ability to walk. You know, there are people that are in wheelchairs, but still, um, uh, you know, feet are super important if you're walking around, carrying your life's belongings, et cetera. And um, 
So foot care is, uh, is really important from just a health perspective, but um, I think most of us can agree that having your feet taken care of, it, may, it can make you feel better all over. And it's also something that you can do um, that's not so intimate that it's like icky, right? <laughs> like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, there's a lot, a lot of things in, in healthcare that obviously you need um, uh, appropriate privacy for, but this you can be, um, can be done in a group, group setting as well, um, which, um, which can really be fun because then there can, can be a lot of camaraderie as well. And so in terms of trying to, um, to uh, model and also uh, you can't teach empathy, but of um, reinforcing empathy in our students, whether they're nursing students, medical students, um, and, and kind of the proper humility um, and meeting people where, th where they're at of doing just kind of basic foot care um, in, in places that are comfortable for people who are experiencing homelessness um, is uh, an amazing learning opportunity for the students. They get to learn about, like we do a lot of these, again, pre-pandemic, hopefully post-pandemic with uh, Chief Seattle Club. Um, and so they get to learn about the different agencies, what work they're doing with you know, different subpopulations of people um, experiencing homelessness. Um, and, and then we obviously also do like referrals for if, if issues are addressed, you know, are brought up that they don't have ongoing um, health provider, we get them connected with that. Thank you. Sure. All right, there's just a couple more questions. Um, another is asking about a particular group. I think this is when we were talking uh, about the regional um, coalitions. There's a group apparently called the Homeless Advocates that comes up in the media. Um, so this listener was wondering who they are and their different positions. That I don't know. There's been, there, there are a lot of, you know, faith-based and, 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 and secular um, groups. Um, some are, um, are actually by people who have experienced homelessness. Um, some by people who are just interested in, in different homelessness issues. So that um, I, I don't know, but that does remind me one of the other things I wanted to mention is I think there's a movement towards this, but not enough um, at the local level, regional level. Um, to include in a meaningful way people who have the lived experience of homelessness and to do that in a supportive way um, that's not re-traumatizing or, um, or not paying people you know, for their expertise um, or just having it as a token kind of a thing. And I, um, I think that that's something that we, we definitely would benefit from increasing. That, that makes sense that those would be people who have the most knowledge of people who are actually experiencing it. Um, uh, another question about hospitals. Uh, one of the audience members is going to be working in a clinic and mentioned, the clinic mentioned that many of the hospitals in Seattle don't accept government health insurance for patients. I was wondering if that's often the case. Um, I'm not sure what's meant by government, I guess, Medicaid, Medicare. I mean, they, they, I'm not sure that would, yeah, yeah. If this person wants to say more, uh, feel free. I mean, um, all hospitals, um, uh, accept Medicaid, Medicare, but, um, obviously for-profit hospitals can, <laughs> can, uh, can find ways kind of around that, um, uh, to not prioritize um, just in terms of re reimbursement rates. I mean, again, in the news here locally, uh, some of the Planned Parenthood sites are having to close because, because of the pandemic, but also because of um, Washington State's uh, low Medicaid reimbursement rates. Um, so that's an issue too. Yeah. Well, finally, um, you probably get asked this a lot, but this is a uh, final question is, wondering how do individuals make a meaningful positive impact on the health of people experiencing homelessness individually and knowing that there's a lot that needs to be done on the policy mm -hmm. level but in the meantime what right. can everyone on this call do in the day-to-day 
That's a great question. So first of all is to treat people with respect and dignity to understand that uh, um, someone who you encounter on the street or um, wherever who um, appears to be um, living, living homeless, um, that they're a person, treat them as a person so that if, if for instance, they're asking you for something and you don't wanna give it to them, um, to not ignore them or obviously don't call them names, um, but uh, you know, just try to look them in the eye and say, no, I'm sorry. I mean, again, just treat people with respect. The other thing is try to get to know, like if you have a specific um, uh, population, like uh, teenagers are close to your heart, um, as we have a you know, fairly high rate of, of teen homelessness in, in Seattle, so it's getting better. Um, uh, find out some of the, some of the agencies that um, work with homeless youth um, in the U District, um, Roots. Um, young adult shelter, um, see what kinds of donations support they might need. Um, and then also connect with kind of larger um, upstream policy issues um, with, um, with, with different um, low income housing institute, there's um, National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and the National Homelessness Alliance. And, and so starting to stay up on kind of policy legislation issues that are coming up as well. Yeah, I've been noticing with the protests happening this last year too, that there seems to be a lot of mutual aid efforts that have been focusing around homelessness. And it seems like in different parts of the city, there's a lot of regular like meal services going on too. Definitely, yes. And some of my nursing students um, were street medics with that as well. Um, so yes, and that, and that is something that's one of the things I love about Seattle is we do have, again, that progressive bent and wanting, wanting to, to do something um, constructive and of, of you know, working, working with um, communities to, to try and actually solve problems. I mean, the, the little free libraries, which you know, across the country, they have a lot in Seattle, are lovely. And a lot of them have turned into little free pantries um, yeah. during, during the pandemic. So yeah, just things like that, knitting for, um, for, for, <laughs> for different, um, groups that uh, help um, you know, homeless uh, moms with, with babies. That's, that's something you can do as well. Yeah, seems like there's a lot of opportunities. As many opportunities as the problem is big. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining right. us. I think we're, we're reaching the end of our time. So I just wanna right. say thank you again thank you. Um, for sharing all your knowledge again. We've got the link to your website in the chat. So encourage everyone to click on that to learn more. We'll be sending it out as well with the video of this recording. So if you have trouble opening things from the chat, don't worry, <laughs> it'll be sent your way right. as well as the link to pre-order the book. Um, also, we love hearing what you think. So please take our survey, which you will find in the chat. Let us know what you think. Let us know what we can do better. Let us know if there's specific topics of programs you'd like to hear. And um, make sure to come back next month. As you saw earlier, it's going to be on Filipino American labor activism in the canneries and fields. And that will be April 21st. So again, third Wednesday of every month. And um, if you learn something new and enjoy what we do, please consider supporting us. Um, and most importantly, um, we just hope to see you again. We look forward to when we can do this together in person, but we're so happy to have you in this virtual space. So please stay, stay, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a lovely rest of your evening, everyone.